Excuse me, little dog. Hi, right, guys. It is a rainy, gloomy, but warm day here. Warm winter day here. In the collapse of global industrial civilization, where we have now slogged into the fourth day of 2023. It is a Wednesday, January 4, 2023. And uh, so... Today, guys, I guess we're going to get into some of this heavy lifting down here for people trying to understand the state of the planet in the beginning of the year 2023. You know, one of the recurring comments I heard from all of these clueless moron normies uh, commenting on my soft white underbelly interview is how... I did not offer any specific examples of how we're getting, how we got ourselves into this mess and why we're so doomed. You know, Mark, Mark basically says you've got 30 minutes to uh, put 14 years of research into explaining why you're a doomer and, and why the planet is doomed. And then I get all of these clueless morons saying Sam did not offer any specific examples. And so, guys, this is what it means to learn specific examples. It's a lot of damn work. These clueless moron normies have no interest whatsoever in doing the heavy lifting, getting down there and studying what is going on on this planet to understand uh, how we got in this mess and how we're not going to get ourselves out of it. They don't want to hear it. And as I say, you know, it, it's a lot of damn work. Uh, but I guess that is my job is to go through the, the since I have found medium.com, good lord, uh, to go through the uh, Rolodex of catastrophe every day uh, looking for people who can explain this better than me. Uh, I consider myself to be a journalist. My job as the chronicler of the collapse is to look at other voices uh, out there who know a lot more about things than I do uh, and help bring their message to the few people on the planet who want to hear their message. Uh, and since I'm too lazy to do interviews myself, uh, this channel more and more is me reading uh, essays that I think will help the few people who are interested in the biggest story in the history of humanity try to make sense of it all. And uh, just when I thought I had, I had found all of these new uh, doomsday prophets on medium.com, here comes this fellow, never heard of this man, Steve Genko, I guess, G-E-N-C-O, uh, holds a Ph.D. in political science from Stanford University. A uh, little unclear, he's the author of some books on marketing. We all know what Bill Hicks had to... I, I'm a little unclear, but I don't want to scare you off uh, by telling you that Steve has written books on marketing and now that I have found him, he has 445 followers. So Steve Genko has really laid out his workload for himself uh, with this. It's going to eventually be a seven-part series titled Where We Are and How We Got Here, The Future of Humanity. And this is part one of his seven-part series um, looking at where we are and how we got here. And he starts off with one of these little, you know, with the three overlapping circles 
which I think is called a Venn diagram. You know where the three circles intersect and in the very middle of it all uh, is that little triangular shaped area and this is where we are that we are at the intersection and overlap of three crises the ecological crisis, the political crisis, and the economic crisis. So take it away Steve and explain this diagram to us. Uh, this is the first installment of a multi-part series on the modestly titled topic The Future of Humanity. I will be rolling out more posts over the next few weeks exploring some of the best science I can find on the big issues determining our future on this planet. Political and economic realities, fossil fuel realities, renewable energy realities, climate tipping point realities potential impacts of world population and and possible possible post carbon futures for a world without oil so we're probably going to check back in with Steve on part 5 titled the coffin in the room catastrophic impacts on human population. I don't know if that's a typo, whether he meant catastrophic impacts of human population or he meant on human population. But we're going to read, good Lord guys, I'm not going to be able to uh, get read all of this. Uh, I will put the link on here. I highly advise anybody trying to understand where we are, how we got here, and the hopelessness of, of getting out of the corner we backed ourselves into. This, this is an excellent uh, primer, primer. You say primer, I say primer. Primer. Take it away, Steve. Genko, Genko. <clears throat> We know a lot about the current state of the world, and most of it is not good. One way to make sense of our current predicament is to imagine all of, of us at the center of a Venn diagram like the one above. We are currently enmeshed in three domains of crisis and existential danger. We tend to focus on these separately as each can produce its own litany of distressing and anxiety-producing narratives without even mentioning the other two. But this approach, which is common in the mainstream media, misses the many ways in which these domains and crises are intertwined and exacerbate each other, which greatly complicates both the severity and urgency of the emergencies we face. So let's look at the three crises. If we want to make an educated guess as to where humanity is heading over the rest of this century and beyond, we need to first understand the main drivers of change in each of these domains and how they are together pushing humanity toward a narrower and narrower path of diminishing options and outcomes. Where that path will lead us is the topic I want to make up in this and subsequent posts. In theory, these three domains should function together to support a thriving human population. And I'm going to have to sneeze with all of this cat hair. Maybe I can hold it back. Okay. 
the ecological domain, which is the domain that I center on here at Collapse Chronicles, what I call the deep end of the doomsday prophecy pool. The ecological domain provides the resources we need to survive. Energy, food, water, and air. And then we move into the shallow end of the doomsday prophecy pool, the political domain, which is the one we talk about the least on Collapse Chronicles, provides the mechanisms, governments, and institutions we use to allocate those resources, sometimes fairly, sometimes not, and of course, the economic domain provides the mechanisms known as markets we use to distribute resources to put things in the hands of people who want or need them. Over millennia, humans learned how to exploit the world's natural resources. We developed food crops and domesticated animals. Yes, we did. We learned how to specialize in trade. We gave up our hunter-gatherer ways and began to congregate in cities. Generally, we prospered and multiplied, increasing our population to about a billion by 1800. Then we discovered oil and the world exploded which brings us into the first and foremost of the permacrisis, as I call it, which would be the ecological crisis that we are in the middle of in the opening bell of 2023. <clears throat> it is impossible to overestimate the revolutionary effects of fossil fuels on humans and the planet. The implication can perhaps best be grasped by considering this fact. The amount of energy contained in one barrel of oil can produce the same amount of work as 23 thousand hours of human labor. In other words, extracting the energy from one single barrel of oil is the equivalent of hiring a human laborer for 7.8 years of eight-hour days, and all of that work can now be bought for a price that fluctuates around $100. The net effect, of course, has been an exponential expansion in both human population and economic production around the world. I was reading another article, I actually think in the mainstream media today, where someone was looking at this and pointing out, you know, along these same lines, that uh, each human, now not only do we have eight times as many people as we did in 1800, but every one of those humans is using an average, I think if I'm recalling this correct, 11 times as many humans as uh, before the discovery of, uh, of fossil fuels. So in effect, uh, it's not when we, you hear this, and I'm citing it all the time, that we went, we've gone from 1 billion to 8 billion, when really, if you were doing this, it would be like, based on our, you know, our energy use, before 1800, that extrapolating that out times 11, we have, what would that be? 
not 8 billion, we have 88 billion people uh, on the planet, you know, compared to uh, 1800. I thought that was a very good analysis, but uh, Steve doesn't talk about that. But let's get back to Steve. <clears throat> Based on the power and availability of cheap fossil fuels combined with a dizzying flow of technological innovations to harvest their energy, humans have created a worldwide interconnected economic system of massive scale and capacity. Global trade, transport over land, sea, and air, food production, storage, and distribution, all of these features of our modern global civilization would be impossible without the energy locked up in the planet's fossil fuel reserves. Pretty much everyone living in the wealthy north today believes this is a normal world we live in. They know no other world, but it is not normal. In the million year history of Homo sapiens, our current world is an unprecedented, essentially instantaneous explosion of people, wealth, innovation, and, as we are coming to realize, life-threatening ex externalities. Nothing remotely like this has ever happened on planet Earth before. A simple graphic presented by UCSD physicist Tom Murphy in his book Energy and Human Ambitions on, an, on a Finite Planet, and he gives you uh, a link to that, captures the uniqueness of our current moment, which is basically, uh, you know, this is Tom Murphy's prediction. We're, we're like this. And when we're as fast as we have come up uh, in the past 100, 200 years is about the same speed we're going to come down. I believe Professor Murphy is not exaggerating when he calls this the most important plot ever. It is the best, simplest, and most effective illustration of both the bizarreness and the uniqueness of our current situation. Our two centuries of feasting on fossil fuel energy has led us to a dilemma unlike anything humanity has faced before. Either we keep burning fossil fuels, in which case we cook the planet, melt the ice caps, and eventually make the Earth uninhabitable for humans, or we stop burning fossil fuels, in which case we must create a new energy re regime based on renewable sources that may or may not be able to power the civilization and population occupying the planet today. And of course, he did not say feed the civilization and population occupying the planet today. Uh, but Steve doesn't have time to get to everything. So far, through distraction, denial, and inertia, we have stayed steadfastly on the first path which is to keep burning fossil fuels. Any chance of changing course would require a global plan and global political leadership, both of which are nowhere to be found in today's national governments or supranational organizations. 
rather than helping us solve our existential ecological crisis, politicians are busy dealing with their own crises, which are not trivial. For the most part, these involve either promoting or resisting right-wing fascist movements, both in America and around the world. So, uh, <laughs> we're not going to make the, uh, the Elliot Jacobson mistake about talking about the fascist movement in America and around the world. So now let us go to the one we talk the least about on this channel, the political crisis. <clears throat> Unlike economics and ecology, politics is hard to ignore. I mean, as hard as I try to ignore it. Uh, it is hard to ignore. Uh, I find uh, between ecology, economics, and politics, I find politics the easiest one to ignore, but it's still hard. Politics is where the drama happens, where the heroes and villains stride across the world stage, where the media spends most of its time, and where we tend to focus our attention. We monitor the latest winners and losers. We cheer our team and boo their team. We plan for victories and lament defeats on the electoral playing field. But politics around the world, but especially in the United States, has become a deadly obstacle to, obstacle to progress rather than its engine. Politics has devolved into a battle between two deadlocked camps, one that sees the existential danger in our dependence on fossil fuels, and one that does not. The latter group is, leverage, is leveraging the fact that, in politics, it's always easier to say no than yes, to block rather than enable. The current world works well for these deniers and their benefactors. It is making them unimaginably rich. They have shown themselves over decades to be unmoved by long-term cost as long as the short-term gains continue to pour in. And those gains will continue to pour in, but only as long as we have fossil fuels to burn and natural resources to exploit. Politically, our situation is analogous to being trapped in a burning house. The current American Republican Party is like a pile of debris blocking the only exit from the building. So inevitably, American politics today is focused on clearing that debris so we can get out of the door. We may be able to clear the debris and we may not. If we cannot, scientists tell us, we will die in the burning house. If we can, we will make it out into the yard, but the house will still be on fire. Now that the debris is cleared away, we can finally face the existential issue confronting us, the fire itself. And I need to break in here just in case anybody is still suffering some delusion that Sam Mitchell is a lefty Democrat. Okay? There is, because I am reading this man's essay does not mean in any way, shape, or form that I believe the Democratic 
party is going to do one damn thing different than the Republican Party. Okay? I am not a lefty. I am not a Democrat. I did not vote for Joe Biden. <clears throat> Moving back. Unfortunately, as noted above, the world is bereft of political leadership. The global community has no viable plan, and humans are showing no signs of being willing to voluntarily accept any sacrifices to turn back the forces of destruction we have unleashed. In summary, our political crisis is one of distraction and paralysis. Sure, we all care whether Donald Trump gets indicted. Uh, I don't particularly give a shit whether Donald Trump gets indicted. I wish he would just go away. We all worry about the Supreme Court's next horrific ruling. We all fret about the fate of American democracy, but these issues in the great scale of today's crises are sideshows. Whether America ends up with a newly invigorated democracy